So I think it's fair to say that the results of ongoing trials and the impact of new technology that's going to be introduced over the next six to 12 months will have a profound effect on the uptake of TAVI. On that basis, Lars, I think you did the first Sir TAVI case in the world, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Could you give us an update on the trial, summary of the trial and then an update? You know, the partner trial cohort B looked at an extreme risk patient, A, at high risk patients. So the next population to look at is an intermediate risk patient. So this is what Swetav is, is addressing, STS score, eight, uh, uh, four to eight, and uh, compare that to, to surgery. Endpoint is all-cause mortality and stroke after two years. So recruitment started? It started um, a little bit more than a year ago, 15 months ago. Uh, they're aiming for 2,500 patients, Medtronic. They have 280 so far, so recruitment is very, very slow, right. despite it's running in both Europe and uh, in the US. And why is that? I think, um, first of all, what we are calling intermediate risk today is probably not as it's classified in the study. I think uh, everyone wants to move a little bit further down, STS score three, maybe even down to STS score two. And also, in some countries in Europe, it's already standard to treat these patients by TAVI, which make it very difficult to get them into the clinical randomized trial. So we're facing a situation where clinical practice is ahead of mm. uh, evidence. Yeah. So at the current rate, it could take eight years to complete. It could, yeah. Which is, yeah. that's not, okay. Yeah. Right, well on. So UK TAVI, Jonathan. Yeah, this is a, a large UK-based randomised trial looking at um, patients stratified by age. So it's looking at mm. over 80-year-old patients with significant aortic stenosis and randomising them to um, surgery or TAVI after an MDT decision or discussion that they're appropriate for either strategy. Um, and it, it's it, in some ways similar, it's intermediate risk, it's judged by age, it, it's not started recruiting yet, but I hope that most over 80 year old patients will be able to go into it, so I hope that recruitment will be will be good. Be quicker than so um, tally anyway. And I think it's a shame that um, clinical practice has jumped ahead of mm. the data, because it's... Uh, it's very important to establish that it is an equivalent technique in the intermediate risk group, particularly with the caveats to the original partner data in terms of stroke and uh, vascular complications and the early delivery system. So I think it's a big shame mm, uh, that recruitment's slow. And so we're going through the ethics process now with UK TAVI. Do we know how many patients we're trying to recruit Offhand, I don't have the, the data precise on, data on numbers, so I, I couldn't give you sure. that uh, truthfully. But I, I, uh, I think, think everyone was looking forward to the results of Sir Tavi. I think they thought that would be good, but that's so that's rather disappointing. Enrico, any trials that you're looking forward to? Not specifically. Okay. So on to new uh, devices, Jonathan, Sapien Three. Anything else you want to talk about? So, I mean, there are, you know, there are a number of new devices that have become available over the past year, certainly this year and previous year. The Sapien 3 is an advance on the Edwards balloon expandable system. And as with most iterations, one of the key things is reduction in delivery size. So if we look back four or five years, the delivery system was 22 or 24 French. Um, the new system is now 14 or 16 French. Um, and that just tells you how far the technology's come. The other key difference with the Sapien 3, um, in conjunction with many of our previous discussions about the complications of TAVI and the risk of paravalvular leakage, is that it has a cuff at the base of the valve, uh, which is inflated with the valve and is ho hopefully there to reduce the instance or likelihood of paravalvular leakage. And it's a very nice system. We've done, we've taken part in the uh, CMARC trial. We've had experience of about 20 cases, and it really is a very nice delivery system, and the results have been excellent, certainly in terms of uh, paravalvular leak and valve deployment. 
Um, of the other devices available, there are a combination of self-expanding and balloon expandable. Uh, the Portico St. Jude system is a self-expanding uh, stented system uh, for which the CE Mark trial is due to begin very soon. Uh, and then there are a number of other smaller devices like Direct Flow and Simitus, uh, which have different delivery systems uh, and we'll wait to evaluate those in due course. Mm -hmm. Last, the core valve pipeline. I think Paul Core Valve uh, is working also on a new generation of the of the frame. Most the biggest difference would be that it's been resheetable, repositionable, uh, which should make it more easy to have an, a more accurate uh, placement of the of the valve, minimize the risk of conduction abnormality, parallel leak. And also, of course, if you can do it as a resheetable, you don't need an introducer seat in the groin. You can come down from, now it's 18 French sheet, outer diameter is 22 French. You can go, come down to true 18 French. Uh, so. But I think, um, I think what, what is the most interesting is the new technology coming out with the uh, direct flow, as you mentioned, uh, Jonathan, and, uh, and the Lotus valve, uh, which, is, uh, which is a new concept. Uh, and I think that's what everyone is very keen to see just not small iterations on, on existing frames, but uh, completely new. So the uh, Edwards and Medtronic have sort of four years, you know, they're four years ahead of everyone else, really, at least four years. Yeah, maybe six years. And... How long do you think it's going to take for the other companies to catch up? We already had got six valves C marked, and within the next 12 months, we'll have another six valves uh, with C marked. So... I don't think there'll be room for 12 different uh, devices. There'll probably be right. three large devices and a, maybe three smaller players in, on, the, on the market. Niche devices. Yeah. So I think it'll be very difficult to come to compete with uh, existing devices if they don't offer something exceptionally new, no conduction abnormality, no power valve leak, no stroke, or very small delivery systems. Otherwise, it'll be very difficult to compete on the technology itself then you should move to a price competition, which, um, of course, also will be interesting for. Absolutely, Enrico, apical closure devices. Yeah, there is a lot of work on apical closure devices. So far, there are four different uh, devices that have been have a different design that have been uh, studied, and uh, one of them get the C approval, the Epica, uh, in August this this year. So. The, the other three will be uh, tested in quite soon in humans, and uh, of course they will get, uh, or maybe not, the approval next year. So I think apical closure devices uh, is a step forward to a full percutaneous transapical uh, approach. What proportion of transapical cases are you concerned about the apex, either at the beginning or the end of the procedure? Well, again, the technology is helping us because we have small delivery systems, so it means that we have small uh, apical um, holes and uh, means that probably we, due to that, we have much less complication in the apex. So right now, the rate of apical um, bleeding or tears, uh, which can lead to uh, damages, uh, patients' damage, it's less than 1%, which is a great, great yeah, uh, result. Yeah. Okay, well, to summarise, there's a, a number of ongoing trials, but rather disappointingly, it seems as if it may be difficult to recruit to some of the much-anticipated trials, randomised trials uh, of intermediate-risk patients. As far as technology is concerned, there's a whole range of different technologies, and as I said in my introduction, I think they're going to have a profound effect on the uptake of TAVI in the next few years. Thank you.